Today, we're starting a, a new message called Church Metaphors, and a metaphor is, is basically a picture or an illustration of a, of a truth. Um, there's analogies with them and things like that, so church metaphors. And in the Bible, there's a lot of church, church metaphors, like metaphors that Paul uses to describe the church, um, metaphors that Jesus uses to, to describe the church, and they all have implications and, and meanings to them. Um, how many of you... Um, watched Voltron when you were younger. Voltron. Yeah, Voltron, a couple of you. How many of you have noticed that it, they have a new version of it on Netflix? Voltron, a couple people, okay. There's some different people too, great. Well, Voltron is basically this. There are five lions, right? And they form this robot together. So you might think that it's a transformer, but it's not a transformer. It's, it's just a robot. It would be sort of like a better version of Power Rangers. Right? In fact, a much better version of Power Rangers than that. And so Voltron, he, he takes these parts and he forms a body. Today we're talking about the body of Christ, which is the church. However, I will say this, whereas everybody in here forms the body of Christ, and we're going to get to that in a moment, it's not like Voltron, okay? It's not like we separate and then we come back together. You, at the point of salvation, are already a part of the body of Christ, and you never separate from it. You're always in it. So with that in mind, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll begin reading with verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4. Game is sick. Ephesians chapter 4. Y'all are really quiet. Really quiet. I'm not saying that you should be talking. I'm just saying it's really quiet in the room. That's, that's all I'm saying. Okay. Number one, verse one, says this. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, that's the church, and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high and led a host of captivities captive and he gave gifts to men. So let's skip down to verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the full measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, by deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working appropriately, that makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So, a couple of things. First, the church is the body of Christ. The church is. The way you gain entrance into the body of Christ is through salvation. You come to a place where you feel bad because you've sinned, and you know that there's a holy God, and so you ask forgiveness for those sins, and you ask Jesus to be your Savior, and he immediately comes in and saves your soul. You don't have to go to church so many times. You don't have to read so many verses out of the Bible. You don't have to do this, that, or the other. All you have to do is by faith accept his gift to salvation. I'm a sinner. Lord, come and be my savior. I can't save myself. And you're in the body. 
Now, the church is the body of Christ. And in Scripture, Jesus is the head of the body. Now, there's another passage of Scripture that says that husbands are the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. And the normal joke with that little deal is when you talk to a group of ladies about it, there'll be one lady somewhere in the, in the, in the room that says, he's the head, but I'm the neck. Right? That's, that's what they'll say, right? And if you've ever watched uh, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, she says it, it is pretty funny what she says it, because she's a big Italian lady. She's just incredible. So, nonetheless, that is not necessarily how Jesus Christ works. He is not the head, and then somebody else is the neck that turns his focus somewhere, and then there's a body. It, it doesn't work that way. Jesus Christ is the head, and that means that he is the one that we look to for leadership. From the neck down, all the way to the toes, we form the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we look to him for leadership. So Jesus is the head of the body. He's a leader. Jesus loves the body and is invested in making her succeed. Okay? Jesus Christ, say that again, loves the body of Christ and is invested in making her succeed. For instance, the first thing he invested was his blood. There was absolutely no way that you could be a Christian without him giving his life. So he invested his entire life so that you could be all you could be for him. Okay? The other thing that he invests is over a period of time, he teaches you from the word of God how you should live, how you should walk, how you should breathe, how you should do things so that you can be the best version of you. Okay? Um, God has designed us all to be a particular type of people. And he is very invested and loves and wants to make sure he moves you along. This, by the way, is why you and I, from time to time, have crisis come up in our lives. The crisis come up, they're in front of us, and we have to work our way through it. Well, that is God working on you to get some type of sin or attitude or just make you a better person or, in, or strengthen your faith so that you can get to the other side. God is very invested in this body. He's the head. We're the body. The body is made up of many people. Many people. Many people. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 says, there is one body and spirit. And then down in verse 7 it says, but grace was given to each one of us, that's the church of Ephesians, that's Paul, that is even us today, according to the measure of Christ's gift. So there's, there's a lot of people in the body. Now, Jesus, now Paul will say, not Jesus, but Paul will say in his writings, there is you that is in the body of Christ individually. I, Philip Brand, am in the body of Christ. And then Paul, in another section, will use this metaphor, and he'll say, um, the local church at Ephesus is all a part of one body. So it'd be like, right now, you and I, if we're members here at the church or visiting or whatever, we are part of the body of Christ at Farmington Baptist Church. It's that church. And then in other passages of Scripture, Paul will use it even in a larger sense, a global sense. And he'll say that all the churches in the world that are believing churches, that believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and he's the only way of salvation, those churches are a part of the global body of Christ. So there's, there's like a specific, I'm a member of a body, and then there's a local member of a body. And then there's a global, all the churches together, um, as members of this body. And then he will go one step further than that. And he'll say, every believer of all time is a part of the body of Christ. So way back when Jesus left, the church started with 3,000 people. Those 3,000 people are a part of the same body of Christ that I'm a part of today. In other words, the body of Christ is not just some type of factual, uh, theological metaphor that we just get warm fuzzies over. The body of Christ represents a movement of God through the ages to rescue people from the pit of hell to allow them to go to heaven and live for them. It is a movement that corrects all the wrongs in the world. Yeah. Y- y'all are really excited about that one. I can tell it, right? It, it is a movement. 
And literally all across the world, there are people in this body and a part of this movement of what God is doing in the world. It's absolutely amazing. It's amazing that I am a part of that and that if you've received Jesus as your Savior, that you are a part of that and that he invests in all of that. So, a couple of things. If you are in this body, and to be in this body, you have to be in Christ. This is just a few things that are true of you. First, we receive grace in Christ Jesus. Our redemption is in Christ. We are justified in Christ. We have forgiveness of sin in Christ. There is no condemnation in Christ. We are a new creation in Christ. We have eternal life in Christ. God supplies all our needs in Christ. We have every spiritual blessing of heaven in Christ. We will be presented to God perfect in Christ. We cannot be separated from the love of God in Christ. That's nothing less than amazing. If, if you're feeling down about yourself, remember who you are in Christ. If you are condemning yourself, remember that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. That yes, I need to stop doing that sin, but Jesus has given me the freedom to not go back to it. I have eternal life where I'm not going to be punished for the sins that I've done against the Creator in Christ we can think about all the negative stuff that's happening in the world and all the tensions of relationships and stuff like this, but on a larger scale, we are part of a movement that cannot be stopped, and we are in Christ, and he cannot be stopped, and we are victorious, and we are one and a part of the same body, and that is an amazing thing. What I would like to submit to you today, first of all, is that I think you and I need to start looking at the world through that lens. I think what happens from time to time is we look at the world through the lens of media. Or we, we look at the lens through our own thoughts. Or we look at the lens through, through our own emotions. Or we look at the, the world through just all types of different lenses. But what if you and I were just to put on the lens that you and I are a body of Christ, part of a bigger movement that supersedes anything this world can match? And in that, we have received grace. Redemption is ours. We are justified. We have forgiveness. There is no condemnation. You cannot put me down. We are a new creation in Christ. We have eternal life. Jesus Christ supplies all of my needs. I have every spiritual blessing. God is doing something. And whatever I'm looking at right now that is a conflict, God is doing something. And he is trying to get the world to be better and us to get the gospel out. He is a part of this. And I just have to figure out how I am supposed to be a part of the redemption process that he has for the world through whatever, whatever it is that I'm dealing with at the moment. You and I are a part of something that's bigger than the government, bigger than Nike, bigger than the NFL, bigger than Hollywood, bigger than America, bigger than the world. We're part of a movement of Almighty God because we're in the body in Christ Jesus. I do not want to be in anything else. I just don't. So the body, and he is the head. So, what does this mean? Well, it means that I look at you as a fellow member and believer in the body. That's what I look at you as. This means that I treat you as a a member of the organization that God is putting together, the body. I look at you through that. I look at you as a part of me because I am a part of Christ. Are you tracking? We're all on the same team. We're all on the same team. And that means God wants us to be in Unity. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to John. I think it's John. I'll have to look this one up. John chapter 17. Turn your Bibles just real quickly. We're going to get back to Ephesians, but John chapter 17. Now, 
John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. It says this. Oh, 17. I do not ask, and this is Jesus praying, I do not ask for those only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be in us, so the world may believe that you have sent me. What was Jesus' prayer for his church? That they would be one and act like they're on the same team. Come on, right? And act like they're on the same team. It is an amazing spirit of unity that happens when you have a group of people that focuses on what Jesus wants to have happen in the world and they're passionate for it. When you have a group of people that aren't about what they want, what they think the church should do, but they are about what Jesus wants the church to do and they follow him. Anytime you and I begin to think in selfish ways, and it's my way, I want this done, I want that done, is the moment that we disrupt unity in the church. You see, the church is not a democracy. It's a theocracy. Jesus is the king, and that's the end of that. It's the end of that. And we look to Jesus, and he has been very, very clear about our mission. And our mission is to reach the world with the Lord Jesus Christ and use our gifts to do it. That is basically it. It is that simple. The mission and the vision God has for Farmington area, for the Davie County area, for the Yakin area, for the Forsyth County area that we all reach in this church is for his message to get out and for people to be born again and a part of the kingdom and a part of that body. That is, it's that easy. We get sidetracked when we start going after things that are selfish in nature, that we want in our church, that we want this and we want that. It is Jesus who is the king and it's not a democracy. It is him telling us what to do. And we find that out through prayer. We find that out through reading his word. We find that out by coming to church and setting aside all of our selfishness, all of our pride, all of our stuff that we would like to have happen or, or see not happen, whatever it, whatever it is. And we set all of that aside and we focus on him and his mission and we do everything we can to accomplish those purposes as a body, as one. In Ephesians chapter 4, it tells us, that he wants us all to do it because when we all do it together, it's a powerful force in the world. It is Jesus Christ that said that we, you and I, will do greater things than he did in the three years that he was here. It is Jesus Christ that said that. What are those greater things? It's sharing the gospel and seeing the miracle of salvation happen in people's lives. He's not referring to miracles. Look, God still does miracles today. So that's not the point of this. God still does miracles. But the point of miracles is to show who Jesus Christ is, not who you are. See, we show other people who Jesus Christ is by the way that we live, by the way that we go about our business, by being unified in a mission and trying our best to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a body. We are one. The last part of Ephesians chapter 15, uh, chapter 15, there's not 15 chapters in Ephesians, there's four. Verse 15 says this, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So let's, let's talk about that a few minutes, okay? Let's talk about that first few minutes. First, we're all parts. How many of you grew up in the 80s when there were like commercials on TV that were short, like 30 seconds? And you remember the Wendy's parts commercial? 
Remember that? If you don't, I want to show it to you right here. So two screens, two screens in? Yeah, just watch this. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> parts are parts. Here's what I want to tell you about that. God has taken a lot of parts and he has squished them together in order to make them better. You do not have to, ha not have to be a perfect person to be in the body of Christ. You just have to believe in Jesus. He's taken all those parts and he has put them together. Now, this says, verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint, which is equipped when each part is working properly. So you and I are parts, but we have a responsibility to work in the body of Christ properly. Properly. So how do we work in the body of Christ properly? Well, there's, there's, there's a couple of ways. There's a couple of ways that we do that. First of all, you work in the body of Christ properly when you are using your gifts to enhance the body of Christ. Whatever those gifts are. All of us have different gifts. All of us do. Now, if I was to take a survey and, and ask you, which part of the body you would like to be. There would be some parts of the body we'd like to avoid. Like for instance, I wouldn't want to be the colon. <laughs> wouldn't want to be the kidney. Right? Wouldn't want to be, you know, things of that nature. And you wouldn't either. However, if I did not have a colon, if I did not have a kidney, where would my body be? dead. So every single part in the analogy, every single part is very important. Now I'll tell you this, there's nobody in here spiritually or, you know, that has the gift of being um, a stomach. No, nobody in here has the gift. That, that's not the point. The point of this is every part in my body has to work in order for me to be healthy. And every part in the church, every person in the church has to work with their area of giftedness for the church to be healthy. There are people in this room that are good at organizing. There are people in this room that are good at building. There are people in this room that are good at singing. There are people in this room that are good at teaching. There are people in this room that are good at comforting people when they are, when they are sad or when something is going bad. There are, there are some people who have very strong opinions in this room. That is called leadership. I've never met a leader that didn't have a strong opinion. We kind of, we kind of, we're in a day and age where you don't want the leader to have a strong opinion, but you're not a leader. If you don't have a strong opinion, you're not, you're not, you don't have the gift of leadership. Trust me on that. If you don't have a strong, if you don't have a strong opinion about something and how things should go and the direction they should go in, you are a manager. And there's nothing wrong with management. Leaders that have strong opinions have to have managers to help them get there. There has never been a self-made man. Never been a self-made man. He's always had people around him to help him accomplish his goals. And by the way, I learned this um, from Convocation at Liberty. Um, the road to success is uphill. John Maxwell would say that you didn't just wake up one day and the church was successful. You went uphill to get there. It was work to get there. And if it is work to make the church all that it needs to be for the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring him honor and glory and to get his job done, then it's work that we should do. And we, all of us, should be administering the gifts that he has already given us 
so that we can grow the church to what it needs to be. If you're a person in the room that just kind of sits back and doesn't contribute, you need to think about how you can contribute to the church. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about service. You know what your giftedness is when you sit in a room and that is one of the things that you walk away with. For instance, I was, I was, I was at the place the, uh, the other day. I'm not going to tell you where I was at. I was at the, a place the other day, and honestly, I don't know who picked the colors in the room, and I don't know who put the pictures on the wall, but they didn't know what they were doing. It wasn't anybody's home, so just rest. But they just didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know. I was there, pictures crooked, there wasn't a theme in the room. It was like they just threw it up there and they started their business. You know what I mean? It's, it's that, sort of, that sort of deal. I walk away visually every time I go somewhere. I see immediately how people are flowing into an event and out of an event. That's a strength in mine. And I can see visually what could be better. I can see tech pretty, pretty quickly. But I'll tell you what I don't see oftentimes. I, I, don't see, I don't see how to have correct English. Okay, I'm working on that. I have this app that I'm trying to do, but it's, it's only going to get so good. And, I, and when there's a problem, like, a, like a, a, a mechanical problem or some type of building problem, I have to have somebody tell me how to fix that. YouTube has been my friend. If you want to fix something at your house, you can YouTube it, and there it is. Step by step, how to do it. And I can follow instructions, but I can't see how to take something apart and put it back together and do all that. There's some people in this room that can do that. There's some people in this room that can organize really well, but they can't necessarily see vision. There are people in this room that have gifts that you really just need to step forward and start using for the glory of God, and you need to do it with some gumption. The other thing that we, we have been taught in this life is that it, it is better to be weak than to be strong. It is better to talk about our weaknesses and how we're not all that in a bag of barbecue potato chips than it is to say, I am really good at this, and, I, and let me do this for you. We need to have permission as a body of Christ to walk up to each other and say, hey, I'm good at teaching. Why don't you let me teach? Without the qualification that, well, I'm not a perfect teacher, I, I'm really not that good. Without all that qualification, this right here, this negative stuff where we put out all our weaknesses is really of Satan to depress us and to not encourage us. You need to grab a hold of your strength and do it for the glory of God. That's what you need to do. Is, is all this making sense? Because a body is healthy when it's doing the jobs that it's supposed to do, and it's doing them well. The kidney doesn't have to do the work of the brain, and it doesn't have to apologize for not being the brain. My heart is not apologizing this morning because it can't hear. My heart is not apologizing because it can't speak. My heart is doing its job to the best of its ability. And trust me, I've put tons of stuff into my body. It's doing its job to the best of its ability. My heart is. I love hamburgers. Oh, I love hamburgers. Got to stay away from those. Oh. So, so your body does. So you, as people, need to do your gift. Here's another thing. I want you to notice, and, and I want to talk to you about this in just a few moments. Rather, we speak the truth in love, verse 15. We are to grow up. Everybody say grow up. Yeah in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint, and which is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body what? Grow. Makes the body grow. Now I'm going to go out, out on a little, it's not a limb, 
This is just a biblical principle, so I won't even use that. A church where the members of that church are involved in ministry is a church that grows. It is a church that grows. It, it's said over and over and over and over in Scripture. So, if I was to ask you this morning, if you wanted to be a part of a growing church, I think everybody in here would, would say, yeah, I, I want to be a part of a growing church. Right? Yeah, I do. A well, part of that, you want to be a part of a church that's growing, that's healthy. Right? Part of growing. What we need to understand is, when a church grows, things change. Things change. In every part of growth, and as you get more people, you have to figure out how to shepherd those people in the best way possible. And there are things that have to happen in order to sustain the growth that God has given you. And so, so things change. What I am not willing to change here and you have to be careful with that phrase. What I'm not willing to change as we grow is the community that we have in the sense of everybody's important and we're kind of laid back. I, I like the laid back feel and we're just a family and we're here worshiping God and learning something about his word. Don't want to lose that ever. But as you grow, it, there, there are things that change. For instance, um, the next step for us is to start on a parking lot right out here. Um, we have plans for 74 spaces um, in the next couple of weeks. If We haven't voted on this yet, but I think people vote with their money. Right? People vote with their money. I think you can start giving to the parking lot fund. It takes about $1,000 per parking space to pave that out there and get it ready. Why do we need parking? Because we're out of it. There's some Sunday mornings we have no parking. And we're parking on the back here. And there's people parking back here. And, and it's just a, a real good thing. Parking has to change eventually for growth to happen. So that means that we probably need to get busy and, and start giving toward that project. Because that's the next step in growth. Okay? Second, and this is going to scare some of you. And that's fine. I get it. The parking lot... You grow, and then it's two services. Okay? I've been working on plans for two services for the last three years just to see when the time is right for that to happen. When we do that, we have to make sure that we are still, you know, family church, family-oriented church, laid back and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, we need to occupy that growth, and that means change. You see, we all... We all want a church to grow, but sometimes we don't want the change that comes with that growth. See, when your body stops changing, you're dead. So what we often do as believers is we, we don't necessarily want our church to change in the way that it needs to, to sustain the growth, but then we don't want our church to be dead either. But if you don't change with the growth that God gives, the church will die. Is everybody tracking with me? Now listen, this isn't us trying to build some type of empire. I will tell you this, I've thought many times, and of course, haven't talked to many people about this, so this is just something I'm praying about. I'm just sharing this morning from my heart. I think once we get to a certain, certain amount of people, I think we start another church. I, I think we take a group of people and start another church across town somewhere. And I'm not so sure that that would be a satellite church. I don't think I look too good on YouTube to be like projected at another location in a very big way. Too ugly. You need a prettier person up here for that. But I do think that our strategy should be as we grow, we train other ministers that think like this, that think like we're following Christ and have the same ministry model, right? And we take those people and we start another church across town or somewhere and see how God does that. And as we continue to grow, we continue to plant and we continue to grow churches. Is everybody with me on that? But that is change. 
The change that scares me about that is I know that if one day in the future, if we, if, when we get there, that there are going to be people that leave our church that I love. See, I get why pastors go from church to church every three to five years. You don't have to be connected to anybody. You've been, you, I've been here going on 11 years, and I'm, I'm too connected. I, I pray for each of you at least once a week. It's a lot of people, okay? It's a lot of people. So basically on Monday, I go through a list, and then I pray for everybody globally. And then I go on Tuesday through another part of that list, and then I pray for everybody else globally. That's how I do it, all right? So anyway, all that to say, that will hurt, but that's part of change, and that's part of growth. We need to continue to grow. Not for growth's sake, but because that is where Christ is leading us at this moment. Is everybody with me? Um, this this Passawani night, um, and this is, this is a preacher estimation. So there's a four-point error level either way. There was at least a dozen new families that came to Awana that I had never seen before. That's awesome. In the youth room, you can take this home because Seth counted them. There are 30 teenagers in the youth area. We were missing 12 of our regulars, which means 42. If you counted all the youth in this church at present time, you would be somewhere between 53 and 56, depending on whether or not you want to count the new visitors that were here today. That is awesome. Our strategy for reaching children and young families and reaching people with the gospel is working and God is honoring that. But there is a lid to it. And part of that lid is a parking lot. You have to expand your parking lot for more people to come so that we can manage the gift that God has given us at this present time. It wasn't by accident that three years ago, God opened up this property back here for expansion. It wasn't by accident. He has a plan for that property. We need to follow that plan. Amen? So, lastly, and I'm going to close with this. If you are not, <laughs> if you are not a part of a small group, I would like to encourage you today to be a part of a small group. Here's why. As our church grows larger, it also needs to grow smaller. And you only really know 40 people in a church anyway, really well. A small group enables you to develop relationships that will last and keep that home feel to the church as it grows. So you meet with that small group, you get to know that small group, you live life with that small group, you walk through life with that small group, right? And as the church grows, it's not going to seem like the church is getting too big if you get involved in a small group and connected in that way. Okay? So, I'm just going to throw that out. So, at the end of the day, you and I are part of a body of a Christ, and you and I need to be in unity. That means that you and I need to watch what we say, watch how we live, watch how we walk, watch how we do things, because we all represent Farmington Baptist Church when we leave here. But more importantly, we all represent the Lord Jesus Christ when we leave here. And I think that he wants us to live like he would live in the world. Amen? And buddy, if that doesn't take you to your knees, that thought, nothing else will. Because I'm not even close to being like Christ. But I sure am going to try to live like him this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the state that you give.